sorry. <laughs> a lot of the speakers are experts. I'm just a person who decided to do this. And there's a lot of us that were, if you add up all the volunteers for all the organizations, there are many thousands of people trying to help in this situation. So what we're going to talk about, obviously, is, um, is, is World Central Kitchen, but the World Central Kitchen responds to many events, mostly natural disasters around the world, uh, particularly in North America and in the Caribbean area has been where they, they started. And, and even as recently as this week, they were helping people in California who have been devastated by the floods. So this is not the only thing that they're doing, but it's by far the largest, uh, I think the largest effort they've ever done. And it has been an amazing experience to be part of it. So I went there to Poland twice uh, in April and then in, in June. And I say the only mistake I made both times was not staying long enough. A lot of people who stayed many weeks uh, or, or you can stay up to three months in the Schengen zone in, in Europe. And some people hit that limit and had to leave because of that. So it's, it's, really, it's really quite remarkable, the volunteers. So the story I want to tell is about what's happening what the what is 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 the crisis in Ukraine and in, in the surrounding countries. Uh, the where is is in in this particular case is in Poland, but I did go into Ukraine a couple of times, but mainly as a tourist. And then you know the who is is about the organization, but it's also about the people, each pe the people who volunteer and the people who um, are part of the staff. It's really been an amazing experience to be part of it. So um, okay, this is not. Working. That's the space bar. There you go. There we go. So just a little bit more about me. I have one wife, one son, one dog, and uh, dogs on the left. Um, that's Evan, our son, who just has got, just just finished up uh, his studies at Northeastern, and he's currently traveling, so he's having a good time. And uh, my wife is, was quite proud of me coming home. She had a sign made up for, for me upon my first return. So let's let's set the stage. Where where what are we talking about here? So this this slide was published on May seventh, um, about the the end of my first trip. Um, we're looking at Ukraine. A lot of people um, it, because we tend to think of Western Europe, and, and don't, many people, myself included, don't know much about Eastern Europe. Ukraine is a very large country. Um, the the capital Kiev, in the, roughly in the middle there. It's where a lot of the news from, from so you might have seen reports of Lviv in the West early on in the war when that was threatened. Um, and, and the right, anything in red or pink is, is the area controlled or uh, by, the, by essentially by, religion, by opposition, by Russians or Belarusians. So when the war started on February 24th, uh, it was a bit of a shock and surprise and almost immediately there was a massive, massive, uh, outflow of, of migrants. Um, so where, where could they go? Well, they couldn't, if they were, well, except for a few of them, they couldn't go any place red or pink. They, 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 you may notice that in the areas of Moldova and Romania in that area that you can kind of show that there are mountains there. So that, it's very difficult to go that direction. Uh, in, in due west into Poland is, is the obvious choice. And in fact, if you, the topography lays itself out that just, just near Lviv, it's, it's an area where the train crosses, the, the main train line that goes from, if you were gonna go from Kyiv well into Poland, you would go right through this, this town. It goes into this place called Shemish, and that's where, where I spent most of my time. Can I interrupt with a question on the uh, trains? Yes. Uh, I, I've read that uh, Russia has its own uh, train tracks, meaning, uh, going to all parts of Russia or Siberia, but it's not transferable. Uh, and yeah. so then in uh, Ukraine, are they, they have to in Europe or? They know? switch trains in Chemish, uh, which is eight, only eight miles from, into Poland from the border. So it, I, there's also some mechanism for that they can do some adapting, but basically there's a different train system that comes in from Ukraine because Ukraine's on the old Soviet system and Poland is on the Western system. So that's about as much as I know about that, but yes, it is indeed a thing. We'll see a little bit about what that actually, what the impact of what that actually is. Um, so this, this particular graphic published in the Washington Post on April 19th was the day that I left the first time. The, the width of the line shows roughly the, the volume of, of, of 
refugees that have been going into the various countries that surround Ukraine. The friendly countries, Moldova, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, and Poland are to the West, obviously Belarus and Russia, there were some people that went either voluntarily or there were some allegations of force to, to, to the East. But for the most part, this massive wave, wave of refugees was headed to the, to the West and most of them were heading through Poland. So you can see that it shows actually the numbers. The numbers, absolute numbers have changed, of course, but the basic idea is still many of the people went into Poland and many of them went beyond. But also Poland has been an excellent host, I think, to many of these refugees, from what I know. My journey started in the, in the beautiful city, oops, sorry, beautiful city of Krakow. Um, and it, it's amazing because growing up it's during the Cold War, I don't know very much about Poland or the East because, well, it was the, the Iron Curtain. Uh, it's possible to go to these places, but many of us didn't or didn't know about it. Um, sorry, why do I have this yellow thing? I don't know. <laughs> uh, oh, technical issues. We're just gonna solve that. I'm gonna. Sorry. I get something. I just want to escape. Hopefully, it stays away. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna. I hit the thing a couple of times. Beautiful city, Krakow. I'll show you where that is in, in just a moment, with respect to where I spent my time in Poland. But you can see this 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 amazing city. Within almost all of the cities in Poland and a lot of those other friendly countries, World Central Kitchen and other agencies that had set up assistance at train stations, almost any train station you would go, there would be a tent or ref, uh, that World Central Kitchen and other organizations for helping people. Here on the upper right, we see the one in, in Krakow. It's a tent, but it's a full-fledged restaurant. They, had, they were cooking hot food, there was fruit, there were desserts. It was a place to eat, a place for the, the people who were transiting through who hadn't, um, just think about it, they, they're in a country, they don't have any money, uh, any Polish money, they're tired, they're hungry, they're going through one of the worst things in life, and this provides a good comfort for them as they're transitioning to whatever they're doing. So I, I spent a couple of days there helping out a little bit, and um, you can see uh, some people working on the fruit stand, I did a little bit of that, um, and that, that was it. I, it was sort of my intro. I wasn't, that was unofficial, unofficial help that I was doing. So one of the things I should give a caveat to also is you're not going to see a lot of pictures of refugees here. Part of the rules were we don't take photographs of refugees. Uh, each, each person we would meet was probably undergoing one of the worst experiences of lies and trauma. And they don't need people going click, click, click in their face. Now, the, some people did get to know refugees and, and actually sort of help them along, even following them as they went to their next destination. That was different. But just taking photos, it's not a good idea. But we could take photos of each other and our work, and, and, and it became part of the fun that we would just document what we were doing. And I took this one on my very last night when I made my way back into Krakow on the way home, and, and I, I had to find a hotel. I, I stayed in that hotel, Europski, there. And I saw the contrast of me staying in this hotel and there's that World Central Kitchen thing and the little, little tent to the, two tents to the left is where some people could stay for the night if they needed to for refugees. So it's just such an amazing contrast. And this has played out again and again and again. If you went to Warsaw, you'd see something like that or any of the, any of the cities in, in the surrounding countries. So this is, this is a little tricky to, to get a little scale. Now we've zoomed in a little bit here. Lviv is here, it's in Ukraine. It's, uh, oh. Uh, I don't know if you can see me pointing to that, but Lviv is on the far right. That's um, a beautiful city within the western part of Ukraine. Shemish is the subject of where we spent most of my time. It says Shemish, but it looks like P-R-Z-E-M-Y as with a little squiggle L. So believe it or not, it approximately is pronounced Shemish, and it's very hard to say for us, so I do my best. <laughs> to the western, a little bit up from Shemish, it's the R-Z-E. W-O-W, that's Sheshev, believe it or not. And that is a city that has a large airport. And when President Biden came to visit, Air Force One landed there. It's ringed with uh, anti-aircraft missiles. Uh, the American air base is there, or American base. Um, and there's, so there's a lot of, that is a, a when, when Zelensky left uh, a, to came to visit the United States, he flew out of there, I believe. Although that was all very secret, but. It's believed that he was flew out of there. 
Krakow uh, of the upper left, which is where I started. And just, just to the west of Krakow, there's that village called O S W E C M. It's very hard to pronounce Polish for Westerners or for me. So uh, when the Germans invaded Poland in, in the beginning of the war, they, they found it hard to pronounce too. And they, they renamed that town to something easy to pronounce and they, and they called it Auschwitz. So that's where Auschwitz is with respect to what we're talking about. Um, I also went to the mountains to have a little fun while I was there. And that's the mountain photo. Zakopone is a village right along the border with, with um, um, Slovakia. So Slovakia is down there. And then this right in the middle again is Shanish, where we're going to be going to. This, uh, the, the blue church is also in Ukraine. So these are areas that I visited and sort of was the field of interest. But almost everything I did was in, was in the town of Shemesh. Again, eight miles from the border. And by the way, any when, when President um, Macron visited a couple days after I left, he visited uh, Ukraine, he passed through there. He was seen. When, when President Zelensky left last month, he was almost certainly went to this train station, which we're gonna see he, through Shemesh. It is the way in and a way out. Now, in terms of all this military equipment that's getting in there, I never saw any of that. Some people did, but it happens in places that there are other border crossings and they're all, it's probably happens at night. I don't know. We're not supposed to know. <laughs> so, uh, but this, this village, this town of, it's about 30 city, about 30 something thousand people, Shemesh, uh, was so, it's been so influential and so important to the people of Ukraine that President Zelensky signed a decree declaring it, awarding it the Polish city, um, the city of, save, city of savior for, for what they have done. Um, so World Central Kitchen, I'm pivoting to World Central Kitchen now, they are an organization that's been around since 2010, started by the celebrity chef Jose Andres. Uh, and in 2022, um, they encountered their first war effort to try to help people, to feed people. Up until then, they would respond quickly. The idea was to respond quickly when there was a, a natural disaster to people who needed food and water, and not a week from now, but today, as soon as, as, soon as possible. And the other thing was their ethos is to, is to make food that is appropriate for the people who you're serving. These aren't meals ready to eat. They're Whole, they're handmade food mostly uh, in, wa in clean water. And it's appropriate for and, and fitting for whatever the particular community is that they're serving. So consequently, we serve food that Ukrainians would like. At least we hope, <laughs> I hope they liked it. Um, they, the food in this particular effort, um, I mean, the, the, in Shemesh, we were cooking and distributing to food to places that six distribution sites, plus a couple of minor ones. But there were two border crossings, and this is the one just the east of Shemesh. It's a, it, it's, it was kind of a madhouse. There's all sorts of organizations there and that people walking across the border would, would go through this and they would be hungry and they could get food there. Then the people coming in the train would arrive in Shemesh directly and there were two, there were two distribution points there. And then in Shemesh also was a very large, a very, very large um, refugee center and that there were two distribution points there inside and outside. Um, what we see here on the left, those suitcases are actually were purchased over there by WCK volunteers who knew there was a need for suitcases and shoes and other things for women and children who are coming, coming through because their suitcases would sometimes fall apart. They've been, they may have been doing this journey for several days and or they might not have had a good suitcase to begin with. So in suitcases and good shoes and sneakers and stuff, they went out and bought Many, many of these. You can only see a little portion. Most things are probably stacked with things. The person in the orange vest was accepting them, and and um, quite uh, appreciatively because they would immediately be put to use. And the suitcases I saw uh, a bunch of them in in the in the shelter, and they were gone the next day, like fifty of them, because it's just such a it's just such a chaotic and and. and and dis disaster going on that, that people needed simple things like this. Um, this particular thing is a distribution point uh, at the in Shemesh train station. There's two sides of the train station. This particular side is the one uh, that heads for the trains heading into Ukraine. 
which sort of answers your question. There are actually two separate separate sets of tracks. And if you go, you can't stay on the train. You have to get off, cross over, and go to the other side. So the, the refugees would arrive, go through customs, and then they're they're hungry, they're tired. This they would immediately see this and be able to get food for free. No questions asked, they can get food. And interestingly enough, you see there on the left is fruit and on the right is some desserts. Now, earlier in the week, they, we had this arranged a little bit differently. And the fruit, the fruit and the desserts were right next to each other. And these little kids would come up and they would pick, pick a piece of fruit and, and they would over the dessert. I thought that was interesting, you know, because they might have not had fruit in a little bit. It was, it's, it, or maybe it just was chance. I don't, I don't know. But you see fruit, which came from World Central Kitchen. Then the, the, the chafing dish things are hot food. Then to the right are like the desserts. We also had water and hot drinks uh, and other, other beverages for people. Honestly, if you've ever traveled and been tired, cold, and hungry, imagine that just times 10 because everybody getting off and, or at the, by this point, everybody getting on because a lot of people were heading back into Ukraine. They'd been a refugee. This is June. They'd been a refugee for three months. A lot of people wanted to go back. The war had changed the, the, where the dangerous zones were by that point. So many people were going back to join their husbands, or families, or business, go back to work if they could. Um, this, this building, which is a, we, we call Tesco. Tesco is kind of like Walmart, but not really, but it's kind of like that. This was an unused facility of a Tesco sort of mall, uh, eight miles from the border. Uh, that they converted instantly to a shelter, capacity 4,000 people. Oh. And uh, the, what you see there, World Central Kitchen on the outside was the outside kit, the outside distribution point so people could eat. I intentionally took this so we couldn't see people, the refugees weren't, wasn't very busy at the moment, but um, outside, this is what life was like. For people arriving from Ukraine who didn't have an immediate next step, they would. They, this was a way stop for maybe a day or two, three, or even a week. They would sleep there on bunks. You'll see a little bit. We weren't supposed to take photos inside. There were a couple that were taken. Never took photos of refugees, but the the facility was. It was just built. I don't know how they did it, but they did. The people who did this in early February. I mean, in uh, late February, early March, just it just came into existence and it is really remarkable. Not that, yes, excuse me. Could I just ask just to, how did you get connected and who all were the volunteers? I mean, were they people from all over the world and how did you get connected? Just so I can understand yeah. that context. It's a good question though. The question is how did I get connected with World Central Kitchen? Well, we, my wife and I were admirers of the organization and Jose Andres for, for 10 years. And then at a, at a point in time, I decided that I wanted to help and I did it because it was something that I knew I could do. I'm very comfortable with traveling, I was comfortable with traveling in Europe. So I knew that this was possible and World Central Kitchen put out the word. They had a website where you could sign up. First, at the beginning, it was like day by day sign up. But after a while, it was like you had to commit to seven day blocks and you could, you could sign up to be in distribution, which really means giving out the food. And then, or you could work in what we call the kitchen, lowercase kitchen, where you would make the food. Now I'm not an expert, uh, so I, I wasn't on the part of the, the, the kitchen where the, you know, the hot food was made. We were put to task like cutting vegetables, prepping vegetables, and then making sandwiches. And there were a lot of us. Mostly the volunteers were from the US, but there were people from all over the world. I, in particular, I think of uh, there was people from the UK, there were people from Poland. There was a Polish woman who was from who's currently living in, in uh, Northern Ireland. There were people from Spain, um, the, the Netherlands. Uh, there was a, there's a woman from Belarus. She actually lives in Australia. She came the furthest, but she's Belarusian, which is on the, the opposite side. But they're not, it's not a uniform opinion. So, um, so, so were things happening in multi-languages? Uh, multiple, <laughs> yeah. 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 So one of the concerns I had is that they, they gave preference to people who knew the languages, but I didn't, I don't know the language and then you can't just pick it up. It's not like, you know, it's no familiarity whatsoever for me. It's very difficult, but I, I, I will show you, I had a good fortune of being with people who did know the language, even of Americans, one who, and I, it was just stunning. So I sort of took a role eventually when I was working inside there, I took a role to sort of did things that were 
less customer facing, all sorts of tasks, putting out the trash, filling up the water, <laughs> dragging water around. We only had one sink, doing dishes, uh, going to the back room and getting pallets of water. Water, we went through like a pallet a day. It, it, it was, um, so there's all sorts of things like that. So the opportunity to volunteer with World Center Kitchen depends on what's happening. Uh, like this past week, you could, if you were in California, I was, you could could have helped out with the uh, with the the floods and, and before that it was wildfires or even the, the, some of the things which disrupt the food the food system in Buffalo when that shooting happened it, it made it difficult for people to get food so they show up immediately it's they have people on their staff they're a very lean and efficient organization they have people on their staff who are trained to just be there and then the volunteers come um, the volunteers are not paid they don't subsidize us you just all you do, you, I just showed up and with a commitment. That's it. And Did you have to have a visa to be here? Uh, it's Poland, um, so you don't need a visa to go uh, for an American to go to Poland. You have an implied visa that lasts three months or anywhere within what they call the Schengen area, which is uh, most of most of what the Europe that we know. You have three months, you can stay there, then you have to leave for three months. And you, uh, there were people who did volunteer for the full three months, and so it was see a couple of those folks. So this was the outside of um, what was called Tesco, but it's actually like the official name is, is something that's more harder to say, but it's, it's basically this giant refugee center. And you asked the question about language. This is my team there that I was assigned with. They just, we, we show up, they say, okay, you signed up for distribution. Rich, uh, we want you to go to Tesco inside. That's, that orientation was 10 minutes and then, uh, the guy on the left had already done it, so he says, oh, go with me, I'll, we'll, walk, we'll walk and take the bus and we'll get there. And uh, so there's, Corey spoke Russian, he learned it in university, he's from Portland, Oregon. Then there's, um, surrounding me, I'm in, I'm a, that's me in there, surrounding me are two women who are friends, they are from New Jersey, and they, they are Ukrainian Americans, and they grew up learning Ukrainian. So I have the dream team, because they could, they, there's nothing more, you feel so, if a little 10 year old kid comes and points to something that's on that back wall, which is like little cereals and pap and stuff like that, that they want, or some toys, we always said we'd have toys. You don't know what they're saying. Like it's so, it's so hard or hard to, to deal with that situation, but you deal, you do your best. And then I would say, Natalia, can you help? And she would, she would come in and, and solve the problem. So it was amazing, amazing to, to work with folks who, who knew the language that, that, and that's, you just did your best. A lot of the actual, there were people who were there working, who were actually paid, who were Polish, who were actual staff members, because you needed this sort of continuity. They, they spoke Polish, I didn't speak, speak Polish, it was hard to communicate, but we did our best. And some people knew some English. There was also uh, a person who was uh, Polish, who, who spoke English very well. She was a volunteer, uh, not part of the staff. So. She's coming up. She's she was also just like my my savior. I just didn't believe it because she could, seemed to know everything, <laughs> and yet she was just a volunteer like us. Um, this is just a little montage of some of the food that we supplied. And the lower and the lower right are, are the sandwiches. And the sandwiches were uh, this that was our equivalent of a meal ready to eat. A very calorie laden, intentionally calorie laden little yummy sandwich that could be made yummier by putting it into a panini press. Other things, um, goulashes or uh, things like that. These are all things that, that were designed to be appealing. We also went through water on the lower left, just literally a pallet or, or every day or two. I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but just we're constantly putting out water. So we had coffee, we had hot chocolate, we had other drinks, tea. We had specific teas that we would get because people were, you know, like certain kinds of tea and stuff. We were trying to do our best to give people what was comforting to them. But the main, the main thing, the main supply chain and everything was, was all part of the, the World Central Kitchen supply chain and then a separate chain for the beverages for some reason, but um, except the water, but the coffee and stuff came from a different direction. But you just did your best. You tried to figure it out. You were just there. Everybody went through the same thing. Just, and remember there's thousands of people here. Every meal that they have for the several days that they're there, they get from you. 
And then we also fed the volunteers because there's hundreds of volunteers, not just World Central Kitchen, there's lots of organizations, there's people helping animals, there's people helping with medical, there's people doing the assignments to bunks, there's people helping, large numbers of people helping what is going to be these people's next step. So they had people who were responsible for matching them up with a host country. Uh, one young woman I felt had, she, she came in like late in the evening and she hadn't eaten all day and she's also oh, hungry. Her job was to, to match transportation for people going to three countries, I think Austria and a couple of other countries. She, she was just working. We worked 12 hour shifts at nine o'clock, the night crew would come on and then the next night in the morning at nine o'clock, we would say hi to them and they would go to sleep. So that, uh, this was in April, it was a 24 hour operation. People were getting food, you know, because it just never ended. In the middle there, there's actually our picture slipped through a couple of, couple of refugees, but this was sort of, you know, we're, we have a little restaurant thing that we're serving food, there were tables. In this giant facility were, were rooms where people were sleeping, but there was also a pharmacy. There was a mm -hmm. room that with just baby cribs in it. There was a room for, for animal crates and things because people could take dogs with them like cats. On the right is a paniniized one of these sandwiches. And we're gonna talk a lot about sandwiches because that was, it was just a great way of, of providing something that people could really get a good meal out of. Some artwork from kids on the left. There's Anna. Um, Anna's the, the, the Polish woman I have mentioned a couple of times. She seemed to know everything. I didn't realize she was just a volunteer like me. I'd only been there a couple of weeks. She's scooping out the food that would be distributed, brought to us. And then we would take the food and put it into the dishes. The food came in these containers. We'd have, temperatures would have to be measured. Food safety was not was not ignored, it had to be adhered to, nothing worse than if we got people sick. On the right hand side, you can kind of see the, some of these yogurt and other things. I did not know this, but people were volunteering to go buy that because the food chain didn't include sour cream and yogurt. And sour cream is very, very desirable for people from Ukraine. Didn't come in the supply chain. So people like Anna were going across the street and buying it by the case. It was unbelievable. So we all started doing that and supporting those efforts. Um, this, this is uh, inside, but there's no refugees in this thing. What you see here in this, in this screen is the, the largest room in the, in the center, in room 13. It had just been prepped about, uh, for a new, a new wave of people that were coming in. This is the conditions that they were in for several days. It was, it was dry, clean, warm, they had food. It was good conditions compared to the alternative, but you can see it's not the most pleasant situation. This was the biggest room. They're labeled. There was people, there was a whole army of people there just to just to figure out who was going to go where. They all couldn't just pick a bunk. They had to know who was there. You also couldn't get into this facility without having every time I walked in and out, you were scanned because it was a high security mm -hmm. situation. Because there were there were issues with human trafficking and other other problems that emerged right at the very beginning. And they, they developed very secure systems to make sure that these people were not being excluded. This, this room, by the way, was, was cleaned up and turned over by US Army service personnel who came in from, uh, from the West and they, they were given leave to, to volunteer. And I spoke with one of them. I said, what do you think about all this? And he goes, this is amazing. And he says, I wish we could do more of this. He says, our, our CEO gave us permission and you know, they came in like 30 or 40 of them and they would come in and, and, and do a big operation like this and come again later. They, they were active duty. They had the, the job to do. <laughs> this would be something they could do to contribute. And they were very, very impressed by the whole World Central Kitchen part of the arrangement. We also fed the, the, the staff, like even the, the security here was, was done by uh, Polish army and uh, Polish military. And they, we fed them as well, because there's no way to buy food. There's not, well, there is, but it's, it's like, it's like, it's, it's not like you're in the middle of the city. It's, it's, it's really, it's really, Inconvenient, people would have to leave for a long time. Instead, they could just come in, get a hot meal, get some, get a nice some water. So the fact that they were uh, not refugees didn't mean that they couldn't have it. Uh, we weren't trying to feed the town, but we're trying to feed the people who are actively helping. Um, here is a, a you can kind of see this is a lived-in section, and Anna's cutting through that for some reason. Um, and. That's it for the first part of uh, inside, inside, test, inside and outside Tesco. So that's what we were doing to distribute the food. And then when I went back in June, I worked in the kitchen, lowercase kitchen. It's, it's kind of was a unique one. Now, 
one thing I should point out, World Central Kitchen, uppercase kitchen, is in eight countries. For this deployment alone, they're in eight countries. And they're in Ukraine, in operating in hundreds of different uh, di restaurants, they call them, that they, that they're, they are that they are providing food for hundreds of these things. The number of meals that have been done in uh, 2022 in Ukraine theater was 180 million. So this kitchen is an amazing thing, but it doesn't represent the bulk of what they were doing. What they're doing is a really smart model. They would contract with people who were restaurant owners, providing them with specs, specifications about what the food that was needed they would sometimes get them the ingredients because they also move food around by the train load, literally. And they would get it to these people and say, can you make us 10,000 of these? And they would say, okay. And then somehow I somehow come up with a price. Or whatever. This is good because it makes the food. It does, they don't have to have an army of people coming in. It keeps the people who are already there working. It gives them, it, it gives them an, an economy and keeps the, that portion of the economy going. I think it's a, a very, very successful model. And literally hundreds of these, I, I don't, you know, they're scattered everywhere because there's, there's a need everywhere. But the kitchen that I worked in, lowercase kitchen, is, is um, kind of unique. They set this thing up in Chambers. They found a facility. They, they, they I think they pre-staged it somehow because nobody knew what was going to happen, right? But they found a building. It was, it was a 10 minute walk from the train station. It was a few minutes walk to the health set, health department because we had to get tested for salmonella three times and, and COVID testing and everything. So, and then it, we, it was an amazing location, but it was also, they didn't talk about where it was, but it's in, in, in Chemish and also security reasons. So they, they, um, this kitchen was this facility that they, in, they somehow were able to convert over to a modern kitchen. They used, they used propane gas, uh, but um, it's, it's this water, there's people working to do dishes. It's, it's a massive building that was there to cook and prep food. And that's where the food was prepped for all of those distribution points. And this, by the way, going back, that giant pan is sort of a signature of some of the World Central Kitchen deployments. It's a giant paella pan that they're making huge amounts of food in all, all at once. And there's a bunch of these going on at any given time. They also baked, there's a baker, they're baking. Uh, the recipe for banana bread says, take a thousand bananas, and I'm, I'm not joking, that was the recipe. So, um, so here we are. Um, and there were people who were qualified to, to cook food. I was not one of them. So they're on the hot side of the kitchen here. On the left is, is this, this person is, um, Christoph, he's, he's, he's like a world-class chef. I mean, he just opened a restaurant in Manhattan of his own, but he's been He's, he's has Michelin star like level. Here he is working, helping out the, the refugees. On the right is, is uh, Chuck, who was on my team to begin with, but he had a lot of skills as well, experience uh, in, in the culinary industry. Um, and he, he did everything. He was, very, he was very excited about being able to contribute in multiple ways. Kinds of, obviously here preparing chicken, it's gonna be cooked for, for one, of the, one of the meals. Another, I don't know what's in there, but these are a lot of goulash-like things that are very, are, are, I don't know if that's actually the right word, but those kinds of meals are very comforting and very good. Um, and this, this is actually fun. So this person that we see now on the screen, his name's Guy. He's going to, this is actually a video that I'm going to show. He did a bunch of these, and it was for fun. He's holding a microphone that's made out of a carrot, and he's going to give you a little tour of the hot side of the kitchen, I think. So let's see if you press the... Uh, hi there, this is uh, Guy, the Crazy Canuck, uh, reporting here for uh, WCK-TV. We're now inside the uh, uh, kitchen here in uh, Premier's Poland. We're going to see if we can track down the chef and see what he's up to today. Hi, chef, how are you? Great, I'm here to you. talk to us here. Uh, how many meals are you making today? Uh, thousands and thousands. All right, what's on the menu today, Chef? Uh, we got some delicious lentil soup with some pork in there. We're breaking down some beef. We got chicken legs with a nice little uh, onion carrot base. It's pretty fantastic. Thank you, Chef. Thank you. Great day. So here we are. We got some guys prepping up some uh, beef. How's it going today? Very well, sir. Good. What are you doing? Say hi to anyone at home. Uh, my chickens. My 
chickens if they're listening to me. I mean, there's some carrots here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you for helping out. Also work last right. year. Now that's Guy, he's, he's from Ottawa, and he uh, was there three months, he went home, did some stuff, and he just, this past week, he's back in the, no, he's not only, in, he's not there, he's in Ukraine, he's in Kiev right now as we speak, um, we're, we're, it's the real deal, he's trying to help, and he's, he's intending to stay a while, so uh, there's people like that, it's, it's amazing. Um, this uh, is more prep. There's me on the right. So the, the people who didn't have skills, but who could use a knife, we would do vegetable prep and sandwich making. So here we are doing, uh, I think we had like a hundred cases of cucumbers that we're, we're making cucumber salad. Uh, and there on, on the left, uh, we're working on cabbages and Chef Noah Sims, who was on MasterChef uh, a few years ago, he's, uh, he was uh, teaching us not to kill ourselves as, we, as, we, as we're trying to cut up uh, cabbage. So we did cabbage, uh, onions, pat, uh, to, uh, <coughs> carrots, things like that, vegetable prep. And also did like, we were doing about 5,000 sandwiches a day when I was there. And so sandwich making is actually interesting. I guess it's a question. Yeah, where did all the food come from with the supply chain issues that we see in yeah. our supermarkets? Yeah, it comes from uh, here. It's coming from Poland. Uh, they World Central Kitchen in this case is contracting with people, and there there is a there is a uh, yeah. I didn't. You wouldn't know walking around that there's a war on or anything nearby. Um, it it was seemed like a normal situation, and they they were they had professionals who know what they're doing. Who, who a big part of this is is the supply chain, and somehow they do it. I mean, they're just making these sandwiches. They had to have these buns delivered every single day, <laughs> thousands of them. Um, and there on the, on the left is mayonnaise. This is the special, the first ingredient of the special sauce that they're preparing the special sauce for one day. And it's basically mayonnaise. And you can see down on the lower right is the tub that's getting mixed in spices and mayonnaise. That's just the sauce that's gonna be used for the sandwiches we're making. These two women, by the way, on the right are from there at the Tufts University. The guy in the middle is from, he's a lawyer from the UK. He came, he went and, worked for a while and he came back later. So the process was to take these buns, put on the special sauce and put a couple slices of cheese, 10 pieces of salami, and then some more special sauce on the top of the bun. And then they would get collected and taken over to the people who were doing packing, which was me. And you can see me in the upper right and the hat, that's me. I, I, I packed like 20,000 sandwiches in the eight days that I worked in that part of the kitchen. And so the process is really, it just sort of becomes sort of a mistake because there were so many sandwiches made. This has got, went on for five months and it's pretty remarkable. So this, another, another video here, a little time-lapse about how sandwich making would work. The whole team, some young people, some older people, some in the middle, well, not too, a lot of people in the middle age, you know, the, the raising kids, it was hard to take the time, but there were some. So college students, the youngest this week was 19 from Maine. <laughs> anyway, and then 
the, the sandwiches would then get taken and this is a fluid process that's going on and on and so they would get put in these bins and then taken over to us and doing the packing we would take it and, and wrap it in plastic wrap and cut them and put them in these bins we knew exactly how many 81 sandwiches would fit in one of these blue bins and you can see all these blue bins you can see one there and we'll see a lot of them later and there was also some red bins yes another you, question you, you mentioned the uh, two 12-hour shifts was this going on all night uh, well uh, yeah you know when in june they were starting to scale back uh, yeah. so i was there working in the kitchen in june and so we only had the day shift by then mm -hmm. we were cutting down in April and earlier, they, they yeah, I think they, they had two shifts and they, they were in the kitchen as well. And they were working, um, doing this Yeah, and the, the, the hot food prep uh, is, is pretty, you could sign up. I know you could sign up for night, night, night crew in the kitchen. And there's certainly, there was food just, it just kept on coming. I didn't mention this, but how did the food get from here? To the distribution points. Well, there was a whole group of people. They were Polish, generally men, and they were, they would they drove trucks, like those big giant box trucks. This food would get loaded on them, or sometimes vans if it was a smaller, uh, smaller distribution. They, and they would you know like forklifts and and it would get it would get taken to these points. And the food was moved on a massive a massive scale for for an effort like this. So we are doing our work. I'm in the all right. You can barely see me. Sort of a choreographed thing here. Nice. <laughs> then I'll get shoved down to me and I'll put 80, 81 sandwiches in a very, very specific way. If you want to jam it, it's just valuable. And music was playing <laughs> to keep us happy. And this is from the other angle, a different day. It's actually my last day that I was there, a different, slightly different. Group. Oops. Okay, try that again. Oops. I want to get this one because this is fun. <laughs> there you go. Watch these knives here. This is, this is really fun. We know limbs were severed in this process. That's key, by the way, the guy who's there now. We'd finish, we'd clean up. It was, this is just the whole system. You know, I inherit, I wasn't there at the beginning. The people at the beginning, you think about what, what they had to do. I was there in, in April and June. So there was a system in place already by the time I was there. It was pretty, pretty cool. And this was the end of the day's work. Those are the sandwiches, the 81, every blue bin you there holds 81 sandwiches, and the red ones are fewer. But, and the ones with the markings on it were vegetarian. We had a vegetarian version as well. I don't think they were that good. Um, it, just, just, it was like a cream cheese thing instead of the salami stuff. And at the end of the week on the Sunday, the our, our staff members is a two Ukrainian women who ran the who ran the kitchen, the, the volunteer part of the kitchen. They they would report to numbers and say, all right, this week we made thirty three thousand. Seven days we made thirty three thousand sandwiches. So there were two packing stations, and I was there eight days. So I did about twenty thousand sandwiches. So with packing, a lot of motion, but, and now I think about people who do this kind of stuff for a living, it's, it's hard, you know, it's, I, I only did it for a short period of time, but just a, a lot of respect for people who are doing food prep uh, on a massive scale like that. Um, and then um, I did actually go into Ukraine twice, uh, but again, as a tourist, and you may remember when, uh, oh, the person named Oleg, who was in the kitchen, and Guy was interviewing him, and he's, and Oleg had a friend who uh, was, on, was on the Ukrainian side. And even the men can't, Oleg must have been already in Poland already. But if you're in Ukraine and in you're in your fighting age, you, which is essentially your whole adulthood, you can't leave as a man, but you can. As a, so most of the refugees are either people who are <coughs> retirement age or they're women and children. So, but this guy on the on the Ukrainian side, a friend of Oleg was doing, he was doing this thing where he would pick people up at the border and take them to Lviv or wherever, sort of as a tour guide. 
and he had a friend actually who who speak spoke English better who he picked up and we got this people to, to give us a tour and for for what turned out to be not very much money we even you know gave them more they were kind of unspecific but it was it was really amazing they were making a little business out of it and they were in the reserves uh not actively fighting but they they could have been and and instead they were trying to to make a little business so here i i crossed over the first time just on my own i went like to the next village but the the real big one was was going to Lviv, which is an amazing place for them to go for one of the first things you see when you cross over the border i was taking a taxi at this point um it's this beautiful church. You see these all over the place. It's unbelievable. Uh, or this beautiful blue church in the village of Moshita, just, just about 10 minutes from the border. Um, then here we are in, um, in uh, Ukraine, I mean, in Lviv, up high up on the hill. As part, I went with four, well, three other um, uh, volunteers and then the guide and the guide's, and the guide's friend, the guide guide, they're just showing us around. And, we, they did take us to a lot of churches and a couple of things I'll point out about this church. One is there's a lot of people in these churches in the day, they're praying for real. They have a lot to pray about. The, um, the, the kind of silver things you there are, they are the protection for the windows because this, this, there are bombs that hit Lviv and other places all the time. Um, so the, some of the things were protected, but for the most part it, it, in June, it was kind of striking how normal it was, unless no tourists really. But it, 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 until the Russians changed their strategy to try to you know, knock the power out, this was a place that life was going on in a way. I don't want to minimize it, the, the, the trauma that's happening there, but it was, it was kind of like, wow, I can actually visit here and it's okay. Um, but the, um, it's changed since then. I mean, it's gotten a lot, lot harder in the winter time here where it's cold and there's no power, sometimes no water. It's very different now. But what I saw was this beautiful city. UNESCO center part is a UNESCO heritage site. Um, and this, 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 these are, this is the sidewalk. Let's see if this works. <laughs> hear that? That's an area, this a missile is coming somewhere in Ukraine and then they are narrowed down. We are walking around and I said to our guide, who's up ahead there, I said, what do we do? And he goes, well, you know, these air raid signings go off all the time. And you kind of listen, you know, plus there's really nothing to do. People, as you could say, aren't rushing to the things. They can hear what's being said. I, I didn't understand it, but this is just life with air raid signs. Now, what's happening now, and what's happening further to the east is, is much different, different. Again, I don't want to minimize this. But we were just going about our day. Um, but having said that, this missile actually did get shot down. This particular one that that area siren was going off for actually was a real missile and it, it was about 30 miles east of Lviv. It was shot down and it, um, it you can see on the right there is some damage that even sh shooting a missile down can still cause damage and, and bodily injury or death. Um, the, the left is, is, a, is a map of Ukraine showing what the activity was that day uh, with bombs, missile strikes and other other events that were happening. And, and um, that particular one is, is, you can tell, you can, to this day, you could go and look up every particular missile strike and use a catalog in the, in the cut and this era, it's, it's amazing what the information flow. Um, so the thing I really wanna leave you with is this, if you have any interest in this, in, 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 in I'm not saying being a volunteer, but if you want to in any way get involved or if you wanna just know more about it, you wanna know that you're, Donations are what they're doing uh, uh, worldwide, wck.org, and just go there. Some of the stuff is really, really cool to see. So, because um, they, it's, it's as an organization, I'm totally impressed. Uh, they're lean, they're strong, they are clever, they have respect for the people that they're helping. They, their mo, their motives, I think, are good. I didn't, um, and the volunteers were really, really. Cool. Um, so I did actually go to the mountains and got to see these glorious sites. It was, it was, it was a wonderful thing. If you ever see, well, why are borders the way that they are? Well, that ridge line there is on the other side. I'm in Poland, but on the other side, it's Slovakia. And if you're going to draw a border, you'd probably draw it along that ridge line because <laughs> what else would you do? In fact, my phone said, Welcome to Slovakia. I was close enough to. 
that actually made that transition. So that's it. Great. Yes, so cool. Where, yes. where did you stay while you were kind of working at the kitchen or kind of the distribution site? So the question was, where did I stay when I was working this? I stayed in um, the first time I was staying in an apartment that I rented like through booking.com. Uh, by the time I got there, um, things were, the, the situation was stable enough that there were actually places to stay that we weren't displacing people. Early on, people stayed like an hour to the west. You had to get a car or whatever. It was, it was tricky. They stayed in Cheshire for, or somewhere else. But it, it because you, there was just no room for anybody and you would be displacing a, a refugee. But I stayed there. And then uh, the second time I stayed in like three different places because I couldn't get the whole time span, but just regular, like little uh, hostel type, not an actual sort of quasi hostel. I had my own room, but those kind of things. It was available. Uh, I also stayed in this nice little hotel. It was just a couple minutes from the train station. We just I had to move um, just because I couldn't get the whole stretch. It was just normal. Did you book that through, I mean, like... Booking.com. <laughs> in fact, when I was there, the first time, there was a, a volunteer who was coming in a couple weeks, and she was panicking. She couldn't find anything, and she was going through a website. I said, oh, try booking.com. And, I, and she, I talked with her. She was in Canada. Um, she she reached out to me because I had posted something on LinkedIn, she, and she just found me and cold, call, cold messaged me, and, and I we ended up speaking on the phone. And uh, she was quite appreciative that I was able to help out because you don't know. It's, you know, it's, it's not like you're an expert in anything. You just say, okay, this is good. And then you read what you can read and, and go by the advice. So, um, but having said that, the, the Shemesh is um, a normal functioning, beautiful city. Uh, in June, I actually got to appreciate it more because the hours weren't quite as long and it was light and more daylight. It was so cool. I and mean, one day we rented bikes after work and, and were able to just ride along the river and up onto the hills. Uh, Shemesh is, is a beautiful place that has a great historical significance in the 20th century. Uh, in 1915, uh, it was part of the Hungary, Austro Hungarian Empire. The Russians and, and Austro Hungarians were facing each other off there. There was a, there was a, a seize, the seize. The, the fortress of Shemesh was actually not a building in the middle, but it was this ring of 20 forts that surrounded Shemesh. And they, there was a, there was a big battle there. And, and then the Russians took it over. Then it went back. I mean, Soviet, I mean, it was Russian fence. So it went back and forth a couple of times. So the, in, in 1915, it was an incredibly big part of the war on the Eastern front. In, in 1940, on uh, 1939, in August of 1939, the, um, you probably know this, but the, uh, August of 1939, the, the, the Soviets and the, and the Nazis signed an agreement, called, uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. A secret part of that agreement was they were going, it was a non-aggression pact. A secret part of that agreement was they were going to carve up areas of influence that were then Poland and the Baltics. So the Soviets got the Baltics and, and part of Poland, which extended further east at the time, we even went into Lviv. The border of that agreement went right through down the river that goes through this beautiful city of Shemesh. So it was key in that in the um, in in the World War One. A week later, World War One started. We all know the Nazis invaded Poland, but the Soviets did too, and they were they were right up against there up until 1941 when, when Operation Barbarossa happened and, and, the, and the Germans invaded invaded uh, the, the Soviet Union. So. Uh, yes. Um, I was wondering, you had said that you didn't think you stayed long enough. Yeah. And, and I was wondering about that. And I was wondering how much cost it took you. You had to find there, you had to find booking.com. Yeah. All that. Um, I, just, I wonder if you could just give a little, um, I don't know, overview. Of yeah. That. Yeah. So the question was <laughs> about my comments about not staying long enough both times. Well, so when you're doing this and you're kind of figuring it out, you don't know what's going to be like, you know, how much should I commit? I did have some time, but what can I do? I have to be away from my wife and, yeah, and exactly. stuff. So what do I do? So I, I went, but then I started seeing that, you know, the efficiency of being there is that you kind of know it. And then you, right. so there is a cost, there's a flight to get there. It's a thousand dollars or so, you know, it's, and then there's, there's all of that. So 
I felt I, need, I could have done more because I saw some of my peers were there multiple weeks nice. or even multiple months. I oh. don't think I would have done that, but a few weeks working in the kitchen as opposed to eight days, say. Mm -hmm. And even though the second time I went sort of made the same mistake, because again, I didn't know what it was going to be like in the kitchen and how, how would I adapt to it and whatever. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. There were plenty of people who did a, a week because they're working and they, they need they can't take that much time. There were people that ranged in the kitchen from 19 to old. And um, they, uh, everybody had a different, different story, a different, a different situation. But the common bond was that everybody was there. Everybody was doing it, paying their own expenses. Or some people were there who couldn't afford it at all, but they, did, they, they were subsidized by doing a GoFundMe or something. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of that because some people, you know, not everybody can a thousand dollars or so to, at least to get there and back at that time. And uh, yeah, you got to stay. It's not it, the dollar goes a long ways for you know, staying, but it still costs money and sure. then meals and whatever. When I was in working in the kitchen, we were there halting. I got basically we ate the same food there. <laughs> that, I mean, when I was working in the shelter, because it was nothing. You just you had to like anyone else. We were eating the food that was there. Uh, the uh, working in the kitchen, we got a great lunch, the food that was being prepared or we, we had or the, yesterday's food. And uh, they also gave us a little breakfast and stuff. But um, yeah, uh, everybody was in one way or another paying their own expenses. And that, that's another way that World Central Kitchen allows their, their money to be so effective because they don't, they don't have an army of people, professional staff. They have professional staff, but they don't have an army of volunteers. Like some of these organizations, all of which I was amazed with there was an there was an organization from Denmark that was helping animals, dogs, cats. They actually were subsidized. I talked with them, and uh, but you know most in, in WCK it's just the volunteers are volunteers. There are professional staff. Um, the uh, for example in in the kitchen is there's a whole bunch of people that for whatever reason they all tended to be women. They were doing dishes, like those giant paella pan. Everything had to be cleaned. Yeah. Well, we would clean up our area, but they were doing the actual dishes in the giant sinks that were, oh. were installed for this. So there were people who were paid because they, you know, they're there every day and it's their job. Right. Uh, but for, but the the volunteers who were doing the the, the, the things that we were and doing. One other question, I, I kind of I'm reluctant to ask you, but. Um, how many other options for food were there at like a border? Were there lots of places where people yeah. could go? Well, at the actual border where people are crossing. Wow. The, Not the border, wherever. Were there a lot of food options for people? No. Not, not at the refugee center. Okay. Um, so people were coming in, and if they're on the train, they don't go to necessarily to refugee center. Maybe they get on another train, mm -hmm. but they're getting off. Now, there are options, but they don't. You know they don't have money necessarily right. um or it's all they're bewildered they don't speak the language it's not like you know there's some similarity but polish and ukrainian and russian are different languages people by the way they speak russian and ukrainian um commonly especially from the east they're a lot more russian but um so russian and ukrainian is what their typical languages are and they, they many of them don't speak any english or or polish so they're in a yeah it's a, it's a it's a bewildering situation they find themselves in. Mm. Um, but they, for the most part, they, these people were not, it was not horrible. You know, like they're not being, they're not injured and whatever. They're just tired and they're, it's terrible, you know, but it's not like we were, there were people who had some injuries, but for the most part, it's just people on the move and right, you right. often women with children and just think you're dragging this big bag. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were people whose job was, volunteer job to help them get from the tr one train side of the train station to the other because you had to go down these steps oh. and just uh, you know you talk or, or it's it, it was hard to keep they had official things yellow vest people they had a thing and their job was to help people down the steps and up the steps to the other mm -hmm. side mm -hmm. i didn't show the other side of the train station but the other side is the main station that takes you to, to trains heading west and so yeah i mean in, in the city there would be places to eat but no, you know. but not like a Red Cross or, you know, that kind of, you, the World Kitchen um, was the 
pulsating place to go for free meals. Yes. It, it wasn't the only ones. Uh, there were other other things, other sure. little comfort stations and, sure. and things. In fact, in fact, there was one little station outside of that big giant Tesco place that there was a man there and I just talked with him. It was a little station, a French organization, and they were just helping people providing some uh, drinks and stuff or like coffee and whatever. And I just needed a break and I was talking with this man and he, he it turns out he was, he was, he had been in Ukraine fighting as a foreign legion fighter. He was from the Sudan, currently living in Australia. And I said, his, I said, he showed me a video that was taken March 13th, I think, in, 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 uh, in Lviv, where he said he was basically messaging, taking the video and voicing over it to send to his family because he thought he was going to die. And it wasn't an idle thought, 35 of his fellow fighters died. Mm. And he decided then, as he survived, that he would not stay fighting and he would go work on the peace side. Mm. It's perfectly safe in Poland where we were. Um, and he did that. Mm -hmm. And then he, I said, how did you know how to fight? <laughs> how did you know what you were doing? And he said, I was a child soldier. Mm. And you may have heard the Lost Boys. Well, yeah, he, he, yeah. Was, he was one of them. Yeah. And now he's he's an adult and he's got a family and everything and and, um, and the stories like it, it it just went on and on people were people were well how they got there what their motives were mm -hmm. how long they were staying um, but the common thread was the volunteers of all sorts and and even non volunteers were were trying to do good yeah in the midst of just and evil food is so essential yes and, and yeah if you go to wck.org look at I didn't do many of these videos that are on there, but there's some great ones that just show uh, Jose Andres um, and uh, it, it's just amazing um, what the ethos is about what they try to do. And it's, it's, it's a really good thing. It's not, you know, if they weren't there, there'd be other things, but you know, some of these organizations, they, they come in with prepared, you know, like prepackaged food, which is great if you have nothing else, but there's nothing like a hot meal mm. if you're cold, tired, and hungry, or even if you're warm. It's just, it's just amazing that, and I think people appreciated it immensely. I mean, you could some people you could see, oh, they would come and hug me. There's one woman who kissed me on the head. <laughs> she was she was from Ukraine. Honestly, I mean, I was talking with a person who had a yellow vest. She was she was volunteering. It turns out she was also a refugee. It was outside another break, and uh, we didn't we we were communicating by. Uh, Google Translate, and she said, "I said, well, where's your family? She said, here." And this, her mother was there, and they were refugees. But yet, she was volunteering. Mm -hmm. uh, the younger, the you know, the daughter. Uh, um, I I was just, just, and her mother came over because her daughter said, "Oh, this person's help volunteering." And she just came over and like kissed me. <laughs> it was it was like wow. and things. Yeah. The scenes that you would see, the people you would talk with. Um, it, I only saw a snippet of what was happening, you know, just, but it was what I saw was just remarkable. Well, thank you. Um, just a, a couple of logistics questions from the folks online. Um, did you ever run out of food? Did you have enough? Yes, we had enough food, but in the, we didn't always have, um, the question was, did we ever run out of food? No, I was amazing how much food was being produced and supplied. Uh, Actually, I shouldn't say that. We, we did sometimes run out of food that during like during this thing, but it would be like, okay, the food's gonna be here in 20 minutes. And then, and then the whole, like those guys delivering food and they'd come in in these big food containers. So, it, so yes, we did sort of run out of food, but not really, and there was other things. Um, but what we did run out of was coffee cups and things like that. <laughs> we were just an endless thing trying to get enough supply of coffee cups. We had like 9 million lids, but we didn't have very many of the right coffee cups. So we'd get the wrong ones. They're too small. We had to put them in soup cups. And uh -huh. It was like this constant struggle. And finally, the very last day, I met a guy who, what, he said he introduced himself as the coffee manager. 
not for World Central Kitchen, but for the whole thing. And I was like, coffee manager. So I, I found the key person, which is another reason why I'd be there a little bit longer. I found a key person who could help us. I said, well, we need this, this, this. We need sugar. We're running out of sugar. Because that wasn't from World Central Kitchen. That was from the coffee supply chain. <sighs> and magically, he an hour later, he has all this stuff because he was tuned in. Now, he, this particular man is from Ireland. And he was there. He helped build out this whole thing. Not for World Central Kitchen, but that whole Tesco place. He helped build it out and he became a key person. And then he stayed there and he's still there. He's he founded his own organization called UA Direct. U, UA Direct, I think it is. And um, sorry if I'm saying it wrong, but this small little bootstrap thing that's trying to do the right thing. They they work out a pole and a bunch of guys and they go into Ukraine bringing in supplies. One of the things that he has that um uh is um uh, as the fall came on and it became clear that it was going to be tragically cold because of the power issues, he founded this thing where somebody in Ukraine is building wood stoves and, and you can fund a wood stove for $150. We did. And the, uh, the idea is that by using a wood stove, people, not necessarily in high rises, but people who have access to some wood, they can, they can have, make some, some meals and get some, get some, uh, some warmth, warmth in their house, uh, their wherever you know wherever they are it is people doing that this this man uh, is still there right now he's been there for since february and he's still doing it for nothing um, i have to go rich thank you very much this thank you for lovely. Coming. i appreciate what you did thank you uh, a question about all you talked about all the organizations on the ground is there someone that coordinates all of them like this, the questioner said they've heard instances where there's just too many people trying to help and it creates chaos. And how did that work? Yeah. Um, when I was there, it seemed to be a fairly smooth system, but I'm sure there are moments when there was chaos. And um, the, the, the idea that there might be too many people, yeah, I think sometimes people would come over cold call, like they didn't have an organization and they just wanted to help. And it, it sometimes they got a little weird, I think, but in the end, I think people found us found a way to help it. If there was, you know, there were people doing this coordination. I just don't know who they are, or how it worked. You just were part of a, you became this like instant cog in, in the wheel. That was a good wheel. And you just kind of went with it. Um, I do know that it wasn't a hundred percent support in gems that I, and somebody said, oh, they want to shut this place down because they're tired of it or whatever. It, 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 the, it did. Eventually, the kitchen was closed at the end of, by this place, he met the refugee center, but the, the kitchen was closed at the end of July because the, the patterns of uh, the patterns of movement changed right. dramatically. Right. But the kitchens in Ukraine, those hundreds of things are still doing their work and they're, and they're moving food around and they're, 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 they're still succeeding in their mission. It's just different now. But uh, and as far as all of the other organizations, yeah, it's hard to know. You know, I, I talked with a few people, or whatever, but I didn't have that much time to really glean what was happening with every every yeah. one of these things. And I mean, some of them, like I, I, one time, I saw this like army of people who were who were emergency uh, like medical people. There was some need for that there, but maybe they got moved elsewhere where they could be more effective. They were clearly a, a unit, yeah. you know. So there was that kind of thing. I don't know. Uh, it's the need was immense. I think, given the situation, and the numbers there, millions of people, and a lot of them passed right through there. Um, the, no, the, the efficiency on the, the way that it was done, I'm sure there's critics somewhere, but I don't know why. They, 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 you can't be perfect when you don't know what's happening and when you don't know what's going to happen. It's like a natural disaster, but it's an unnatural disaster. And, and nobody knew exactly when this was going to happen or that it was going to happen the way that it played out. Or even now, nobody knows what's going to happen. And so people are doing their best. And I, their best is pretty good. So. Thank you. Thanks. So much. Thank you for being, thank you for being on, on, on the Zoom, wherever's on the Zoom. <laughs>